No, absolutely not. He was going to cross that sea on a certain day. Why? Because there was somebody he needed to go see. Somebody he needed to go see. Now we notice in verse 23 through 24. 23 through 24. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. He fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. Now I want you to know something today. When Jesus came to this earth, it was not all roses, was it? It wasn't all roses with Jesus Christ. He had no place to even call His home. The Word of God says He had no place to lay His head. He had no place to rest Himself because He was a man without a home. He was on a mission from God. It wasn't always easy, but Jesus always had peace in the midst of the difficulty. But there was a couple of people that followed Him. They were stressed out and worried. You ever been stressed out and worried? That's an apostles. The storms of life blew up. We know this story. We know this history, right? The storm blew up and they were all scared. It reminds me, it's like God was preparing them for a specific time in their life. Do you know what time that was? It was when Jesus would hang on the cross. There they would go, well, it's a great storm, a raging storm. We don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. Now, we talked about that some last week, if you remember, that there were two that didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go, but they just took the next step, right? Well, the apostles, did they, were they, them spiritual giants, did they take the next step? No, they ran and high. They hid up in an upper room, locked themselves in. They're terrified because of the storm that they had gone through. But let me ask you something. Was Jesus terrified? He knew what had to be done. He knew what had to be done. And after praying to the Father in the garden and sweating them drops of blood, He went to that cross. Now why did He go to that cross? Well, it was on a certain day for sure. And there was a certain reason for sure. And that reason was for you and me. But well, those apostles were terrified. Here they are again in the storm, terrified. And Jesus gets up from sleeping and He says, Hey, I'm going to tell you all something. I got this. He said, Just be quiet. Storm, be still. See, stop raging. And it does. And they're reminded again. The apostles are reminded again that this is just not an ordinary man. This is Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the sent one of God. Now I want you to notice now in our text, I want you to look with me in Luke 8 again. And look at verse 26 through 28 because this becomes very, very important for what we're dealing with here today. And they arrive at the country of the Gadrenes which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of a city, here it is again, a certain man. Do you see it? Do you see it there today? Underline it now. A certain man, which had devils long time, and were, wore, no, uh, wore no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tomb. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Most high, I beseech thee, torment me not. Listen, friend, this is a great picture for us today. It's a history. It actually happened, but it's a representation of all that Christ came down to do. He goes into this, they, they land their ship, they go into this cemetery where there's a man filled with a thousand demons. A thousand demons. Demon-possessed man. What is he? He's naked. And he's destitute. And the tombs. What are tombs? What are these things? It's a graveyard, right? It's a place of dead men. It's a place of dead man. Who is this man? He's a man doomed to die surrounded by other dead men. I don't know if you know where we live. We live on earth. Let me tell you what earth is. It is a tomb. It is a place where there is nothing but dead men and men about to die. That's all it is. That's what we live on. The, the Word of God talks about it. Job says, man is few of days. Few of days and it's full of trouble. This man who was in this tomb had not very many days and his life was full of trouble. And he was naked and without home. Uh, listen, this is a picture for us today of Adam, if you would, in the garden. Adam, who had it all, but was 
kicked out of his home. Adam, if you were, who uh, was dying as soon as he sinned against God. Chained up by his sin. Kicked out. Destitute. And what did, it, what did it say? He was naked. Remember when Adam took that fruit? Adam and Eve took that fruit and they said their eyes were open and they saw that they were naked. That's what this man was. Naked and destitute amongst the dead. Now, man tried to help him. Man tried to help him. Man tried to, to usher him into a, a right path and, and tried to rehabilitate him. When that didn't work, uh, man gave up. They said, let's just chain him up out here. Let's chain him up out here and get him away from us because he's an evil, vile, wicked, lost, no good man. Let's get him away from us. And they chain him up. But listen, the chains that man put on, the help that man tried to give, all that man tried to do could not help this man. Break him. And he cut himself, and he cried, and he mourned, and he weeped because of the sorrow, because of the pain, and because he was a man without any hope. Do you see it in the text? How he was without hope when Jesus came across the sea, and the demons inside of him knew who that man was, who knew they knew who Jesus was. This man, in all of his guilt. He was not bound just by the fetters. He was bound by guilt. He was bound by shame. He had lost his home and his family, his town, all of these things. He's bound and he sees Jesus coming. He runs to Jesus' feet and he assumes something. He assumes that I'm so sorry. I'm so no good. I'm so beyond hope that Jesus Christ must come here to judge me even now. He must be coming to torment me even now. I'm of, of no value to anyone. I'm not of any value to Jesus. He says, Jesus, you must be here to torment me. You must be here to judge me now. You must be here to go ahead and send me to hell because I'm not worthy of heaven. I'm a sorry, no good person. When we say, man, Jesus, what are you doing? You sure went a long ways through a hard road for a sorry, no good person like him. Jesus, you really stooped down when you reached down to get this man. You really went down when you when you went to go to Gadarenes and, and get this demon possessed man. You you went as low as possible. And this man he goes, You must be here to condemn me. So let me ask you a question. Did Jesus come to condemn? No, he did not. John chapter 3, verse 17, the Word of God says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You say, John, but He had to, be, he had to reach down deep for this guy. He had to go far and long for this man. Friend, let me tell you something. He had to go further for you and me. He had to go further for you and me. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. The Word of God tells us just how far the Son of Man had to go for you and for me. This is what He said. He said, Who, being in the form of God, Jesus was God and is God, the form of God. Everything that is God, Jesus is. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God in every single way. But He made Himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. God, let that all of creation should serve, serve the creation itself. And was made in the likeness of man. How far did Jesus stoop down to get you and me? He became a servant. He crossed a span that was much greater than the Sea of Galilee. And he went more than through things than just one storm. He went through a cross. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see the picture it's painting for us today? Jesus came at a certain time. Jesus crossed the sea at a certain day. Jesus came into a certain man. All because he was in a certain state. Doomed. Friend, we're doomed without Christ. But Jesus came 
for you. He came for you. He reached down from the glorious home of heaven. From the throne room of God where he, he enjoyed the complete fellowship with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. All as one. Communing as one. In the joy of one. In the peace of one. He left all of that. And he crossed the great divide so he could reach down. Reach down for you and I. Friend, you and I are that certain man. We're that certain man. We're that man possessed. We're that man naked. We're that man harming ourselves amongst the dead. A dead man walking around with a bunch of other dead men walking. That's who we are. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, Jesus proclaimed about Himself. He, this is His prophecy in Isaiah, and Jesus repeated it in the New Testament. He said, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. So He came not to condemn us like the man thought. He came to preach on us good tidings. He had sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. This man was brokenhearted over his sin. He was cutting himself and bruising himself as mournful and miserable. Miserable. To proclaim liberty to the captives. He was captive. He could not go back in town, could he? they chase him out and chain him up again. And he'd break the chains and he'd come back to town. They'd chase him out and chain him up again. They said, we don't want you here. He was broken hearted and he was a captive. But Christ came to set him at liberty. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now this is future, but it's important for us, the next part of Isaiah. Because Jesus didn't, he didn't uh, quote this part because it was future to him. And it's, it, uh, it's going to be in our time. Listen, it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. When is the acceptable year of the Lord? Now is the acceptable year of the Lord. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the opportunity for you and I to accept Christ as Lord and Lord of our life. And listen, if we do not, if we reject, if we turn away, there is something else to come, and that is the day of vengeance of our God. That's what it says in Isaiah 61. That's what he's saying. That's what he's talking about. If we bypass the acceptable year of the Lord, then we'll land ourselves right at the vengeance of God. And then he says this, he says, all those that have gone through this valley of the shadow of death, who fear no evil because Jesus is with us and His rod and His staff it comforts us, those that have come through the end of that valley, he says this to us today, he says, I'm going to comfort all those that mourn. I'm going to comfort you. Child of God, this world, even though it is sorrowful, it is not the end. Amen? Amen. He is here to comfort us. And at the end of it all, it'll wipe away every tear. And the sun that beats down upon our brows will no longer beat upon us, but it will fill us and radiate through us because He will radiate through us. <coughs> Verse 37 of our text. Notice what He says as He goes on. Very important for us today. Let me fill you in on some of it. That man, he comes before Jesus, and Jesus casts out those demons, right? And they go into a flock of swine, and the swine, they go off the cliff, right? Remember that, remember that part? We don't want to forget that. And here this man is, who is demon-possessed. He's been set free. He's been set free. And this is him at the feet of Jesus, 37. Now, he's at the feet of Jesus worshiping. The whole city comes out to see him, and they're amazed. And verse 37 says, The whole multitude of the country of Gadarenes. This is a well-known person, a well-known problem. They came out to see. It says, Round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear. And he went up into a ship and returned back again. Listen to that. Listen to that. Jesus came, but was rejected of men. Jesus crossed at a certain day to a certain place to a certain man, but the masses still reject. Is that you today? Have you rejected the one that came? Have you rejected the one that was born a lowly birth in a stable in a manger? Just good enough for the animals to eat out of? The Word of God says very clearly, the lepers, the harlots, the publicans go into the kingdom before the Pharisees would. Remember that? 
Word of God says the people saw a great light, but they loved darkness more than light because their deeds were evil. Now what about the other man? You see, we don't often talk about the other man. You, you have your Bibles. Turn to Matthew 8. It's very important that we see the other man today. We're going to come back to Luke chapter 8, so mark your place. But Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, look at verse number 28. Now, Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, it tells us again about his entry into Gadarenes. He enters into Gadarenes and he goes straight to that, that graveyard, that, that place of the tombs. And notice now what Matthew records for us. He's not the main character, but it's very important that we take note of him for you and I today. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28, and he says, And when he was come to the other side of the country of the uh, uh, Gadarenes, as Matthew puts it a different way, Gadarenes, there met him, notice that, two. Two. Possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. You know, Mark and Luke did not record the other man. So, John, why would they not record the other man? Because that other man had no part with Jesus. That other man came out with the man who we're, we're talking about, they came out, they saw Jesus, Jesus approached them, and as Jesus began to do His work, one of them turned and walked away. He was satisfied. He was satisfied being a dead man amongst dead men. He was satisfied with His demon possession. He was satisfied being bound. He was satisfied being miserable. Listen, friend, the, when the Son of God comes before you, when the Son of God knocks on your heart's door, when the Son of God crosses the great span on a certain day at a certain time to deal with a certain person that is you and I, listen, do not do as this man and walk away. Walk away from his only home. Because he was satisfied in the cesspool of the tombs. Don't be satisfied with what this world can give you. Instead, look for the glories of the next. Matthew chapter, uh, Luke chapter 8, notice verse 38 and 39. This is after Jesus gets into the boat. When Jesus gets into the boat, now the man out of whom the devils were departed. So you've got to be specific because there was two. The one that came and, and was healed of Jesus, he besought him that he might be with him but Jesus sent him away. He sent him away. He said, Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. Jesus said, no, you need to stay here. This is what Jesus said. Return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. That is your job and mine today, say person. Jesus, on a certain day, at a certain time, say person, contacted you and I through the Holy Spirit and we're gloriously saved. And He said, now I want you to stay where you are. I'm not going to come get you just yet. You need to go and tell everyone about the salvation you received through me. Now, He wanted to go with Jesus. But He didn't. He goes and He begins to witness. The Word of God tells us in verse 40, it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received Him for they were all waiting for Him. Back over at, at, at the other town. Back over at Capernaum. But listen, this reminds me of something very important. Jesus, when He rose from the dead, Acts chapter 2, verse 11 tells us, Ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you to heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go into heaven. Now this man, the man of dead dreams, he's healed and he's, he's whole. And God says, I want you to go to that town. I want you to go to your hometown. I want you to tell them all the great things that God has done for you. How that He's cleansed you. How that He's made you whole. And how that He can save you also because they're kicking me out. They don't want me here. Jesus said the perfect yes, he leaves. And that man, he does exactly what God wants him to do. 
In the Word of God, we learn that He testifies of Jesus Christ. He glorifies Jesus Christ. And everyone's amazed at how this man has been changed. He's been made whole. He's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And Jesus didn't tell him when He was coming back. Because Jesus came back to gather in us. And when He came back the second time, there were thousands waiting for Him to come. Thousands gave their life to Jesus the second time. Thousands turned their life over to Jesus. Friend, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but He's coming back. And it's up for you. It's up to you and me as God's servant, as those that have been healed, those that have been cleansed, those that have been redeemed and left behind for a time to tell others about Jesus' saving grace. Why not today? There's no better week than this week. When we're all, the whole, all of America has Merry Christmas all over the place. Jesus has come. Jesus came, friend. And if you're saved, He came for you. And there's some other people around us that He came for as well. And He's going to knock on their heart's door. When? On a certain day. To a certain person. And it's for you and my, uh, me, my, myself, you and me. We're to tell them of Jesus' love. And then He's coming again. Get ready. For He's coming again. He's on His way. He's on His way. I'm looking forward to it. I hope that Rise and Arkansas, Cleveland County, and wherever you're from, I hope that they're ready by the thousands when Jesus comes back. Just like we learned in this parable today, this story, this history today. Why don't we prepare for an invitation? Why don't we do that? Listen, today is a great day. To be a child of God. It's a great day to be a child of God. Say, John, well, I thought yesterday was a great day. Well, yeah, yesterday's gone, though. Today's now. Tomorrow, we'll deal with it. Sufficient uh, to the day is the evil thereof. We've got to deal with the day first. Amen? Today's a great day to be a, a child of God. It's a great day to tell others that Jesus loves them. It's a great day to say, Merry Christmas. Do you know about Jesus? Today may be their certain day. And they may be that certain person. Amen? Well, wouldn't it be good to see somebody delivered from the bondage of sin today? It would be. It would be glorious. Let's all stand. 260. As we sing, lift up your voices and sing to the Lord.
And may God bless you. Um, I'll put you my just for a Thank you.